Hey everybody, welcome back to the Outer Regions Podcast, the show finally with its own name where we talk movies, shows, games, whatever else. And, and world news. news. Oh, world please. news. We and have world. news because I'm a piece of crap and I'm going to turn this show political. Mm. Sorry, Ron. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Fox News, CNN, Blaze TV Podcast, the show where we talk about Iran and basically everything else that does not pertain to <laughs> Guys, I, I, in all in all seriousness, though, there are some things that I would like to talk about on the show. Just some uh, thought provoking ideas. But anyway, but Tate, the thought provoking ideas involve the fact that Scott Derrickson. <laughs> okay, before yeah. we jump into the topics, <laughs> let's talk about this. So, this is episode forty. We are now the outer regions. We're going to try to dig our niche in in YouTube and in entertainment. What we're going to start doing, we're going to start pre-recording the podcast. So no more live podcast. But to keep fan interaction and everything, I want to start by saying this. We we want to pre-record so we have more freedom in recording time. We have a little bit, so it's a little bit more streamlined. So we have more freedom. Right, right. So and, and I, we will. Yeah, we, we, we decided to make the, the podcast no longer live because we wanted to be kind of tighter focused, so we can kind of have a more not necessarily a structured conversation, but just this is considering this is kind of like the main piece of content that we're doing on the channel. We figure as we're doing other smaller videos where there's there's more opportunities for doing uh, streams and, and and live stream content throughout right. the week and at other times when we're not just doing the podcast on Sunday. So. Um, we kind of figure the podcast being the main staple of the channel that we can focus live content on just other things. Whenever we have a topic or thing we want to talk about or <clears throat> play a game, we can do that live instead. Right, because fan interaction does matter very much to the two of us. But in the podcast format, just for ease of listening, ease of, ease of viewership, we do want to stay very concentrated on the topics. Don't want to tangent too much based upon chat. And, um, and like I said, we still, we, we love you guys, we appreciate you guys, and we will be doing live streams throughout the week. Ross and I have been thinking about doing, well, this is Ross's idea, I'll give him all the credit, but doing a series where we watch Resistance and, and, and cringy shows, cringy Star Wars content, we can even watch cringy <laughs> Marvel content, kind of like a caravan of garbage situation, but not, you know, not ripping them off, of course. Much oh god, to, yeah! I didn't even think about. I didn't even think about Mister Sunday series caravan of garbage and coming up with the idea. No, it was just um, it was just thinking like, man, I don't want to torture myself needlessly to watch uh, Star Wars Resistance uh, or or the garbage that is the bulk of Star Wars Rebels season two, which I've never put myself right. through because we, we've been you know. discussing perhaps watching Rebels on the podcast. For like, a while. dude, I mean, if I'm, if my eyes are going to bleed and I'm going to lose my hearing, I want it to at least be for a video. So we're going to start up the cringe fest series and maybe that's something we can do live. That would be fine. I think, I think doing that live would be a great idea. So we could see the chat reactions. Also, yeah, in terms of live stream, we might stream some some video games, Battlefront, GTA, the like. Just mm-hmm. we, we want to diversify content on this channel, like I said, to dig our niche in entertainment, but also to entertain you guys, of course, because that is number one priority, is to have a good show, to have fun content, and just to have fun with this channel. Because, you know, guys, you know, the MGF channel is so focused and serious. What? You know, <laughs> It's just, it's just Scary. honestly, it's like, it's like sitting in a graveyard during his well, funeral. I mean, listen, man, shit I can't mean. get serious if Kappa comes knocking and is like, hey, <laughs> hey, have you been doing this for over a decade? Well, guess what? Fuck you. All right. No, I'm just teasing Ross. No, but it, it, this is, this is a nice, this is a nice platform to just kind of talk mm-hmm. about things that are not Lego, you know, and, yes, and, sir. and to do more. We want to do more with the outer regions, but anyway, do more, save money, podcast more. Let, Walmart. Let's just jump right into it. Do you even watch Phil DeFranco tape? I used to. You used to. I still do. All right. See, so fake Star Wars fan, fake Philip DeFranco fan, fake fan of all of it. So let's start off really quick. Let's just touch on Hawkeye. Yeah, the Hawk guy. It's funny because I'm actually. Um, Working on Hawkeye right now, I have uh, the paint rag on the lap. I've got the paint bottles in front of me. 
going to be working on the Hawkeye a little bit throughout the stream. But my Hawkeye figure that I'm working on aside for the next Endgame Showcase coming out this month on my channel. On um, <laughs> the promotion of the shameless self-promotion. Um, some report came out, and we're, we're, not, we're not good at this, by the way, so I don't even have the report up. Um, so I couldn't even tell this you. This is a casual news run. All Dude, right. Hawkeye apparently got delayed indefinitely. The, C the Hawkeye series, according to MCU Cosmic, who is reporting on Charles Murphy's claim, um, that Hawkeye has been delayed. Because, apparently, it has been removed from um, the production schedule. Now, please don't take anything I'm saying as, as fact. Take it all with a grain of salt. Who the hell knows? Look into it for yourself. See what's, see what's uh, you know, actually well, like, concrete here. But it's not. It's probably going to miss the mark. This this happens. Um, this happens all the time, though. I mean, we saw this with, yeah. what was it, Inhumans or something like that that they were supposed to make a movie on? What's up? Weren't they supposed to make like an Inhumans movie for uh, for Marvel Year Four, not Year Four, um, whatever it's called, Phase Four, and they just uh, canned it. They they canned things. Oh my, my yeah, Inhumans. In yeah, Inhumans. They, they, they've canned. They've canned. They've canned things in the past, so don't be too sure, surprised. Man. And this is not a priority compared to Captain America and then the one. No, and, and I mean, listen. If they want to launch Kate Bishop's story, you don't necessarily need Hawkeye to do that. I would really appreciate it if Jeremy Renner was there to shepherd the next Hawkeye character into the future of Marvel and then leave himself. But um, I hope the series still goes through. Because while we've definitely had our fill of Jeremy Renner as Hawkeye, and I don't feel dissatisfied with the amount of screen time we've had uh, as Jeremy Renner playing Clint Barton... Um, what I did really like the idea of was Haley Steinfeld playing Kate Bishop. That was the rumor floating around that um, once she's out of her Apple Plus series or out outside of that deal, um, once she has the first opportunity that she would apparently um, be Kate Bishop and that Marvel may even be waiting for her uh, to have the opportunity to do it, which they have done before. Uh, Doctor Strange was delayed a full year. Well, I, or it was like six months to a year. The first Doctor Strange where they waited for Benedict Cumberbatch, which I thought was pretty, you know, I didn't know that um, until sometime after. But the point is, this is still a great series idea. This is still just the perfect way, I think, to start up uh, Kate Bishop's time in the MCU. And if the series doesn't make it through, that would be a real shame. Yeah, um, dude, that's like, I think it still will, to be honest with you. No freaking Siri. Just, you can't Dude, even... can we talk about Siri for a second? Dude, my Siri comes on and I say Siri sometimes, man. When I, I'll say, I'll say like, hello, man. And then Siri will come up and be, hello, man. And she'll, she'll say it back to me. And it's so weird. It is so weird to me how, how yeah. poor Apple's vocal recognition software is when Amazon has that shit on lock. You say Alexa, and she's on point. You say anything else, she's like, nah, I, I can't hear you. <laughs> I don't understand. Nah, I can't hear you. Doesn't want to hear it enough from the lizard man. Excuse me. <laughs> Can I get my no, take man. on my guy? Check this out. Oh, boy, here it comes. I don't care. There it is. I don't give a fuck. Kate Bishop is a kind of a shitty character in comics, in my opinion. Oh, the MCU is good at uh, taking characters that from the is, comics and re reframing them to be... Dude, Iron Man was such a bad substitute. character before MCU. Iron Man was mm -hmm. such a... I mean, you, you have the run, of course, where he becomes an alcoholic. And, and that Iron Man issue, when he really struggles with mortality, morality, being a billionaire, being an ethical human being, you know, that's a good run. But, no, you're 100% you're right on that one. Yeah, so... Um, if it doesn't make the 2021 mark, that's a shame. But apparently this means that Miss Marvel and She-Hulk could be moved up. Or it's it's Miss Marvel and basically that if this show doesn't make 2021, 
there are a myriad of other shows that are obviously in production that are starting up. They're already casting for a bunch of them. Um, like I know they're casting for Moon Knight and that, you know, basically if Hawkeye doesn't make it next year, you have a plethora of other shows that will, you know, any number, any one of those shows can take its place and it's fine. Um, and I think Jeremy Renner would still be down to play Clint Barton whenever the time is right. So, yeah, man. But Tate, yeah. while we're talking Marvel news, what I'm more concerned about is Scott Derrickson leading Doctor Strange into the multiverse of madness. This this picture we have, dude, I'm just looking at it. And this guy looks so goofy. I don't know who this guy is, but he looks so goddamn goofy in the picture. I'm coming, looking at. coming from <laughs> the guy goofy. who is literally the human version of Beast. Um, <laughs> Guys, okay, wait. Real quick story, because we tangent on this show. Mm-hmm. We discovered... I Well, we didn't discover. This kid I knew in a high school messaged me, and he said, you look like human beast with a picture attached. And I look at the picture. I go on Snapchat to do, like, the double picture thing where, where you can have a picture behind you and, and, and Snapchat, like, green screens, rotoscopes your your, your face into, into that picture. I look like human beast. You do. I look just like him. Same face shape, same nose shape, same eye width. Mm-hmm. But I don't look as goofy as that guy. Let me just say, he looks goofy, man. Are you saying I look goofy? You look what do you have against people goofy. wearing glasses? You look extremely goofy. Like your hair head ass. You got, you got the Han Solo 1999 I've got, Lego I've got hair. the Lego hair. I've got the balloon head. I mean, not many people <laughs> have... Uh, I mean, dude, I am the I, I am the perfect combination of, of like, Lego minifigure... Uh, big head, skinny fat, like, I don't know. Ross? That, 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 those are pretty much the three categories to define my physical appearance. But guys, you know what? At the end of the day, Ross is the actual progenitor god, and he will he will usurp God's kingdom in heaven and, and become supreme <laughs> ruler of life. So mm-hmm. we can't get on his bad side. That's right. Because I, I will be able to just... With um, because I am the minifig customizing guy. Um, I I will, <laughs> I I will take nail polish remover and and just erase all of the filth from the earth. Oh, and uh, get an eraser on old on the that, old ones. Just use an eraser. That is what the Book of Revelation says, and uh, I'm not a good Christian. But um, <coughs> since uh, oh this God. this entire show has gone totally off the rails, as always, we have. Left the regions. Um, yeah, we're in the outer regions right now, boys. We, we have. You see, this is what the show is about. This is why it is called the outer regions now, because we do not exist in any one region. And for, for I mean, listen, man, I've never touched weed in my life, but anyone watching this episode would definitely think different. And I can't really blame them. So who cares? Now, who cares? Now that you know we're, we're now that we're here, we're having fun. Now that we're here, I am upset, Tate. I really am, because while I am excited for the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, of course, with the Infinity Saga ending, there was this overwhelming sense of wow, we are closing this chapter on our lives. Robert Downey Jr. is done. Chris Evans is done. After Black Widow, Scarlett Johansson is done. The original six Avengers are fragmented. It's 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 the MCU will forever look different. We all knew this going into Endgame, but it didn't make it any less real when it actually happened. Obviously, and now when they announced this the slate for Marvel's future, I mean, obviously you have some real wild cards in there now, like Eternals and Shang Chi. Um, and then, I mean, when it comes to the shows, they were just, I mean, with Disney Plus, just unlimited Disney money that's just, we've got Falcon, and then Winter Soldier, WandaVision, Loki, What If, Hawkeye, Miss Marvel, Moon Knight, She-Hulk, I mean, just craziness. And so there's this concern that with all this production ramping up, and the MCU just pumping out and kicking out so much material every year, going forward, it's like, oh my god, listen, I'm not on the Scorsese boat. I don't think it's cool 
to hate on Marvel. Is Marvel formulaic? Sure. I mean, does Marvel have plenty of problems? Absolutely. I still derive the majority of my creative inspiration from the MCU, though, because I still love the fundamentals of it. But that being said, the concerns that immediately became real for me again following this announcement of Scott Derrickson leaving Doctor Strange 2 was just, I really hope going forward, and especially when you look at the Black Widow trailer and just how packaged some of that looks, it's like, and after Spider-Man Far From Home, I really get concerned, man, because I don't want Marvel to adopt and, and maybe even embrace a packaged feel. Right, so so many people would already argue, and I know you would take that Marvel has already gotten to that point where it's already packaged. But dude, I think it can get a lot worse than it is. One and plus I one really equals don't... two. That's the problem. A... One plus one is supposed to equal three, Ross, and it equals two with Disney movies. Yeah. So I get concerned because I mean, when they announced Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. It was announced, Scott Derrickson returning, horror movie. It's going to be the scariest Marvel movie yet. But then Kevin Feige, he was quick to say, hey, uh, that's not going to make, that's not going to mean that it's rated R. It's still going to be PG-13. He was immediately, he was quick to temper the audience expectations on the spot. And um, I was very excited because I was like, oh man, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness you're going to have Scarlet Witch coming in. You're going to have WandaVision tying into it. Who knows what Wanda's going to do to reality uh, to kind of spur on the events of Doctor Strange 2. And so now Scott Derrickson has left citing creative differences. And no, no, I need to rant. That's, I, that's scary, man, because but, I, but, because no, I love no, Doctor no, Strange 1. No. Doctor Strange 1 like clear, made it clear that Scott Derrickson is just the ultimate Doctor Strange fan to have in that director's chair. And so I'm concerned now. I really am, because Doctor Strange 2, Multiverse of Madness, is like the number one MCU project I'm looking forward to out of anything coming out. Yeah. All right, Ross, shut up. My turn. Fuck you. This is the problem with Disney. <laughs> they cite creative differences on almost everything they produce because they want their... their directors and their and their creatives to pay penance to Disney to be submissive to open their cheeks just just to allow Disney to overcome them and it's so frustrating man if this guy is the is the biggest Doctor Strange fan of the entire directorial world why is he not trusted with the source material right so Doctor Strange what is it called Multiverse of Madness? It's so good. In the Multiverse of Madness, that is, yeah. That's, I, I shouldn't say... Oh, come on. I mean, that is so lame, man. No, I don't think it's lame. I think it's it's very, it's very you know, it, it's it's something like that would be slapped on a, on the front of a comic, so I think it's fine. It's, it's lame. And they've it's, earned... it's a good lame. You know what? It's a good lame. Anyway, you know what? Anyway, if... Hmm. If hmm. he's the best of the business, then this next Doctor Strange movie is just going to be 1 plus 1 equals 2. Right, Doctor Strange was a good movie, man. It didn't take any risks, but it was a good movie. You know, fundamentally, I I still think it was. I didn't enjoy it that much, but I I I, I think it's a good movie. They need creatives. They need people who will drive and challenge the, the the viewer. They don't need creatives that just open their ass cheeks to Disney. I'm getting sick of it. Right. I mean, look at what happened with the Skywalker trilogy, the the Ray the Ray Skywalker trilogy. It's it's frustrating because you know what JJ did? Oh Papa Disney, please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Here, here, here is my butthole. Insert your ideas and dominance into it. <laughs> it's like have some personality, take some risks. One plus one. Sometimes it has to equal four. Sometimes it has to equal ninety six. All right, this is filmmaking. This is not math. Mm. This is not. This is not something you can equate. To an AI, like what is it? Who is doing it? Warner Brothers. Yeah, Warner Brothers. They're going to develop an AI that'll help them figure out which movies to green light and 
That's the so uh, value stupid. generated by star power and what films will make will make uh, See, you know generate good revenue. Why are we in this dystopian future where we're filmmaking is a science instead uh, of an expression of creativity? It's so frustrating. So you know what, The Irishman. It's the same movie that Martin Scorsese has made a hundred freaking times. But at least it's interesting. At least there's some element of oh, I wasn't expecting that. Right? Martin Scorsese makes the same movie every every 10 years. The same movie comes out. And those are more enthralling and more unique than these Disney movies. When they have all of the money in industry, in the industry, they have any director they want in the industry, any writer they want in the industry, and they just end up formulaic. It's so frustrating. And we're going to talk about Legends uh, Star Wars continuity in a bit. And, and we're going to kind of delve deeper into what that means for Star Wars and what that means for kind of everything in general. It's just really frustrating that, that the creativity in Hollywood is being lost to now, and, and to the point where, where studios are developing algorithms, right? <laughs> Why would you cut off the most, the most, how do I say, knowledge based creative? Right? Why would you knock him off because of creative differences as opposed to just making the movie he thinks should be made? You need to place trust in, in directors and in, and in the people that are developing these ideas. Think about Star Wars. If Star Wars was never made, if it was never greenlit, the world would be completely different. Where are the risks in Hollywood now? Non-existent. Yeah, and I mean... It it, may, it makes me genuinely sad because I mean, while yeah, I agree, Doctor Strange didn't take any risks. It did open up a whole new door for the MCU to explore, right? It it ulti it ulti you know it it opened up the, um you know, not like the, the 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 multiverse in the traditional sense where you're just in parallel realities, but the MCU multiverse, right, where you can go into other little dimensions and and uh, see millions of baby hands and other crazy shit, um. And, 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 you know, introducing all the powers of reality and, and, and just really integrating Doctor Strange and, and all of his myth, you know, the mythos of Doctor Strange and, and the lore of the character right into the MCU. Pretty much all of it, right? And he did a great job. And I didn't expect to like Doctor Strange as much as I did. And I genuinely enjoyed the release of that film. But now, getting to the future, man, it was like, I, I was so excited. You had the perfect mix for a Doctor Strange sequel. I mean, bringing in, calling it into the multiverse of madness, going all in on the multiverse, horror elements, Elizabeth Olsen joining in as Scarlet Witch, and then having Nightmare potentially as the villain. I was like, oh my God. And Scott Derrickson back directing. This is the perfect combination to make basically the Captain America, the Winter Soldier, but for Doctor Strange, just the, the follow-up that no one expected to be as incredible as it winds up being, but now I'm concerned. Um, you know, I, I uh, it was just it was just such a random cold tweet that he put out too. It was just Marvel and I have mutually agreed to part ways on Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness due to creative differences. I'm thankful for our collaboration and will remain on as EP as executive producer. And it's like. Dude, could you imagine <laughs> leaving a dream job like that, right? Yeah. And then you you, you, just, you just, I mean, just for a public announcement, you said to put out a, a, a cold, you know, soulless little tweet basically announcing that you just stepped away from the thing you love the most. I don't know if I want to put those words in his mouth, but I mean, he's a massive Doctor Strange fan, obviously, as proven um, across his years working with Marvel and, and making the first film, but... Yeah, um, I mean, dude, looking at the upcoming slate for the future of Marvel Phase 4, looking at everything, Black Widow, Eternal, Shang-Chi, Thor 4, all the Disney Plus shows, I mean, they've got a really good slate of Disney Plus shows that they announced, obviously, with Falcon and Winter Soldier, WandaVision, Loki, She-Hulk, Moon Knight, Miss Marvel. I mean, just an incredible roster of, of things they're working on. But out of all of them, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness is the one project that I was the most excited for. And now I'm just uh, really concerned because it's like, 
what happens if they just grab a Peyton Reed, right? And just throw him on just so that he can work the cameras and, and, and work with the cast. And then just that's that. I, I don't know. I mean, it's um, disheartening because I was already concerned about the future of Marvel because of this i was afraid with all the all everything they're trying now that they might to get it all made adopt a very packaged style even more so than before like we've been discussing so i hope that's not the case i hope marvel phase 4 succeeds and i hope doctor strange 2 works i hope uh you know this isn't as bad as it may seem um I guess, I guess Scott Derrickson's going to be back uh, to working on other horror films. Either way, man, that pretty much covers it for, I think, the MCU talk for today. Man, I hate Disney. I don't Disney. really have anything else to add. I hate Disney. That's what I have <laughs> to say. I have not enjoyed a Disney film in a while. Oh, I enjoyed Far From Home. But that's a Sony film. So I haven't, no. I haven't enjoyed it. A Disney film mm. in a while. Anyway, oh. anyway, hey, I want to go, go check out 1917. I really do, dude. Oh my god, that movie's so good. Did you see it? Uh, yeah, I did, and it's 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 incredible, man. It How is. Did you see it? I saw it. What? I saw it recent, dude. I saw it like two days ago. I thought I told you. You did? No, I don't think you did tell me. I saw it Friday, I think. Uh, no, I saw it Thursday. Dude, it's so good. It's just... War movies have gotten so stale, and I very much enjoy war movies, but this one, man. I don't want to talk... I don't want to talk too much about it, but it's... It's cinematography is just gorgeous. I mean... I love war movies. I love history. I'm a huge nerd. I have an encyclopedia collection, and I have, you know, ten encyclopedias just on World War Two and World War I. Mm. Uh, seeing this perspective, I mean... Of a World War One movie, very, very cool, very cool. Thank you, thank you, um, whoever made the movie. The guy who made a Skyfall made this one. I don't know his name. Cinematography though was incredible, dude. Oh my lord. We should talk about that movie next week, man. Uh, you, you should go see it. We should talk about it. That'd be fun. Yeah, no, I think I will. Um, yeah, I think I, I, pro I probably, I probably have enough um, points saved up. Yeah, man, they just go check it out. Dude, quick. you should consider getting the Regal Movie Pass. You pay twenty dollars and you get unlimited movies. Twenty dollars a month. I don't go see movies every month though, so. <laughs> oh yeah, but still though, think about it. If you if you bought it when like a Marvel project releases, and you go see that Marvel project five times, you're saving a boatload of money. Mm. Consider. Mm. It looks awesome. I'm still not happy that. Uh... <laughs> You know, that I, I even have to go to Regal. It's nice to have a theater because I know people live out in the middle of nowhere way worse than I do. But, I mean, uh, I miss having uh, IMAXs and AMCs, man. Yeah. Definitely do. The last five years without them, it's been weird. Um, anyway, guys. Yeah. Let's move on to Star Wars Legends continuity. we got a picture of Plagueis here. It's a nice-looking render, man. Isn't it? I forgot who made it. I think uh, the guy has an art station page. I mistaken. think his name is is Martin Antel Garth. Is that his name? Mm. That's Martin that's, Ant Mar Martin uh, Scorsese. Um, secretly a Star Wars fan, doing renders uh, for Legends characters. But um, Legends is so much higher quality because of the fact that it is written by adults for adults. It is not hindered by a necessity to appeal to children and families. Therefore, you get higher higher grades of more structural you get higher grades of writing and more structurally advanced writing something that 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 only somebody who 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 is used to reading who is used to uh who's used to fictional works can appreciate right a 10 year old can open Plagueis and appreciate the 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 structure of the book the detailing the verbiage it's great it is something that only only a, a, a literate person can enjoy. So Disney can't do that. Disney cannot make things that only literate people enjoy because they have to appeal to kids and the general audience. And it's so mm. frustrating. Ross is rereading Plagueis. I'm just, you know, thinking about it retrospectively. I love these books, man. I love Legends. 
I think it's it, the, the stories are incredible. Highly esteemed writers are working on these on these books, or were working on these books. It's just great. These are great stories written by great authors, and we just will never have this again. Right, and I, I, I mean, I, I totally echo everything that Tate's saying. It's just like, but I think the, the thing about Star Wars Legends is I see a lot of it everywhere now following the beginning of the Disney era in 2012. You have a stigma against Legend. I think there's an unspoken stigma that was created once Disney made it clear what was canon and what wasn't. And... But one thing that I very much agree with with Pablo Hidalgo on, who said who has said it before, it's like there are there are still great stories that you, you, you doesn't mean you should not enjoy Legends material just because it's not in Lucasfilm's continuity as having happened. I mean, I think Star Wars is more fun when you enjoy whatever parts of it you want, and then consider whatever parts of it you want as canon. I mean, who cares? If that makes you, because that, that's because that's something that I adopt, and I think that's something Tate adopts too. Is just oh no, no, you know what I adopt? Mm. Legends is canon, canon is not. <laughs> All right, Clone Wars is the only safe thing. Mandalorian is safe. The rest, sorry, dude, not even Forces of Destiny. Oh god, maybe the Vader comic because Vader comic's awesome, but um, mm. Afra. Fuck you. Get out of my life. <laughs> Resistance, get out of my life. Forces of Destiny, you can stay. There it stay, is. My friend. No, man, but I mean, guys, like, beginning, I, I mean, several years ago, I think in 2016, with the Ahsoka book, that was my first novel that I listened to in audio form. Awful book. Um, as much as I love Ahsoka. That, that's not a good book. Um but I went on to listen to many, many audiobooks over the years, and that's something I never really talk about. Um, but I've listened to a lot of new canon books, like Lords of the Sith, Battlefront Twilight Company was a highlight. That I think Battlefront Twilight Company is the one exception. It, the, ba Battlefront Twilight Company is the one book in new canon that I think reads like a Legends novel. Seriously. Um, that is very, very detailed and not concerned about... Um, the packaged look that Disney has adopted for Star Wars. Um, however, you know, I, I went on to listen to other books like Catalyst, A New Dawn, the first Thrawn book, um, and have just gotten a really nice dose of new canon books. And that also includes like Jyn Erso's uh, prequel novel, Rebel Rising, uh, Battlefront Two was a huge, was a really good one. Uh, Inferno Squad, far better than the actual game story. Um, by leaps and miles, I listened to Dark Disciple, which was kind of a crazy ass story. But um, yeah, but then I listened to Thrawn Alliances as well. And so what I'm what I'm making clear here is that I've listened to a pretty nice, um, you know, a pretty good amount of new canon Star Wars books, and I have enjoyed many of them. I enjoyed all of the ones that I listed there. But when I finally switched on Darth Plagueis last year, I was just blown away. Because it's not just an early 2000s Legends book that is that, you know, is, is hyper detailed and, and kind of disconnected or not really concerned with what Star Wars is, is supposed to be. No, this is and I mean, that, that's why I was excited when I when I picked up the actual Plagueis figure from Big Kid Bricks and did a whole video on it on my channel unexpectedly, because I adore this book. It is the ultimate Star Wars experience following the two Sith Lords that went on to successfully enact the grand plan and take over the galaxy and destroy the Sith. I mean, these this book covers their lives. It covers parts of Darth Tenebris' life, to when he orchestrated the birth of Darth Plagueis, all the way to Darth Plagueis ultimately killing Tenebris. And I'm just saying these because these Tenebris, events are just more like Tenna bitch. <laughs> not a, imagine having imagine having an apprentice and Dude. and and a, a grand apprentice. And what I mean that I mean like grandson. He's a grand apprentice because of that. Mm -hmm. You know that that Jamaican guy that came out of nowhere. You know what I'm talking about? 
What a guy. Dude, freaking Biff, Sith Lord. Tenebris deserved to get some rocks dropped on his ass. Um, no, but then... Then it just... It, it covers... It's only like a 13, 14 hour book, but it covers their entire lives by cutting around to the most important parts all throughout the entire length of the book. And it is just so incredible because it is so detailed as it's so authentic to every little detail in Star Wars with every senator that exists to the discussions. It's, it's a book about politics. I mean, it is, it is full-blown politics. And people tend to criticize the politics in Star Wars when too many, I think, do not recognize the importance and the significance of the politics in Star Wars because it is how Palpatine rose to power. It was the politics. It was what he did on Coruscant. Manipulating people, influencing people, buying influence, using it and deploying it at the right moments, at the right points of time, sometimes waiting decades, sitting on a goal, sitting on an objective, never forcing his way into things, but slowly across decades with Plagueis, whether they were on Coruscant or Muting List, manipulating their way to getting Palpatine in the Chancellorship. And it's just incredible. I, I cannot encapsulate it in, in one podcast episode here, but it takes Darth Plagueis, and he's no longer a Sith legend. It's no longer just the tragic story of Palpatine's master. It makes him into a person, and you follow that person with Palpatine together across decades as they slowly take over the galaxy. What I love about Plagueis... Right, is that this this character completely in the right, you know, completely finds himself to be in the right. He is doing what is essential to save the galaxy, right? He's right, doing what is least. essential. He's doing what is essential to to save the Sith ideology and to become an a, a usurper king, right? To to to. Mm -hmm. You know, further evolution and, and and further the world. I mean, he sees himself as a, as a god, as a as a patriarch, right? He, he sees himself as superior as, to other Sith that came before him because of his achievements. And as this grand and scientist with this grand involvement, you know, he finds himself to be a god amongst amongst the um, amongst the populace. And it's so fascinating to see this perspective of this man who's just so so deeply rooted within himself and within his successes never once has failed and then you do see one failure um part way through the novel before the time jump when he is attacked and then you see his ultimate demise and failure at the hands of palpatine so fascinating man such a character I study. Mean, yeah and, and and then the book and how it culminates of course as everybody knows in the ultimately and ultimately the, the murder of Plagueis. i mean i thought that the murder of Plagueis was something that kind of happened relatively fast. It was a surprise move, and Palpatine just did it, and it was over. No, it, I mean, when you get to the scene, man, it is so satisfying. And, and the speech that Palpatine delivers is just incredible, as he, encap as he just pretty much recaps the entire book, but also their lives together. Because I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand with Palpatine, because it goes without... It, it's unspoken. In Star Wars. Plagueis and Palpatine spent at least 40 to 50 years together. Think about that. 40, 40 to 50 years together as two Sith Lords operating in secret, hiding in plain sight, across four or five decades working their way up buying influence and secretly enacting the grand design under the jedi's noses and he's not in the films plagueis even though he's very close to being if you look i mean there are moments you know because of course somebody that some may know plagueis was still active during the phantom menace um he was very close to being in certain moments in the phantom menace but the point is Plagueis is as much, he is as, as real and as important of a character to Palpatine as someone like Anakin. 
Because think about, I mean, like, because Palpatine spent a large portion of his life with Plagueis, and, and by the time you get to Rise of Skywalker, God forgive me, I mean, you're talking still. They they spent half the, he spent half his life with Plagueis, man, almost. And um, Plagueis is an incredibly interesting, multi-layered, and important character to the Star Wars galaxy, and and the book just you, you get to know him you get to know what he believes you get to be right there with him and palpatine as they're scheming as they're speaking to certain key figures in star wars i want to spoil who um because there are a lot of important characters in the book but it's just incredible because it is the ultimate love letter to the prequels and to the clone wars because it was written while the clone wars was airing so we can only imagine that uh, Lucina worked with either George or Dave Filoni or members of the Lucasfilm Story Group at the time before the Disney acquisition and the Lucasfilm Story Group was kind of replaced with a bunch of Disney lackeys. Um, you. But listen, man. Now that I've listened to Plagueis, which, by the way, is an incredible listen. You should definitely listen to it, not read it. Read it! Don't no, be a loser. No, no, it's a full blown audio experience. I mean, it's really good. Um, the narrator does an incredible job voicing both Plagueis and Palpatine, and it's read it. it's read it. It allows you yeah. to, it allows you to apply your biases and and experience of Sith and of evil characters into your into your experience. I disagree, man. I, I get what you're saying, and I, I, I think that there is definitely an experience to be had there. Um, but I think the audio series is just phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Yeah, but, um, but you're, you're, you're a little dumb. Excuse me? All right, little man. Little excuse me? Just because I'm not Tarzan living out in a hut with, with, no, uh, with, with Costco freaking AirPods... I mean, it doesn't mean that you can't appreciate an audio series. Mr. I have to go and dig up the ancient Sith texts and, and, and imbue myself with the dark side of the Force, but in real life, to fully understand and transcend <laughs> the legends, the experience of Star Wars Legends, and ascend beyond basic plebeian levels of humanity. Ross, sometimes you... an audio, a good, sometimes there's fun to be had. In an audiobook, have okay, even, and not everyone is a reptile. Have you even listened to every voice line that Darth Tre has in the Knights of the Old Republic series? Have you listened to every story of Darth Tre? I mean, have you even have you even learned to code and ripped every line of dialogue from the source code of that game? Yes. Have you? Yes. You know, knowing you, you might have. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do anything for Star Wars content, man. Especially nowadays. So anyway, my headcanon in Star Wars has always been, uh, after the Disney acquisition, it has been, obviously, the six films. The sequel trilogy, which I'm so, I'm just about ready to remove at this point, and, and just kind of consider, like I talked about when Rise of Skywalker came out, an extension, but not a continuation. Um, a branch that can be snipped. And then, obviously, the Clone Wars, of course. Rebels, unfortunately. And then, to me, man, Plagueis and a like stories, especially Revan's and Malik's and, and Bastilla's and Vitiate's, I still consider all of that canon. Darth Bane's story, I still consider canon. There are some exceptions I'm willing to make. Like Darth Nihilus, I don't need to exist. <laughs> you know, he doesn't need to be part of my head canon. Well, he doesn't do anything. But, right, there's just so much, in, there's so many incredible stories in the Old Republic era. I mean, take the sacking of Coruscant and the life of Satil Shan and Jace Malcolm um, or, or, you know, Darth Malgus. And, and the depth that that character actually has um, behind the cinematics and behind the game. I'm very much looking forward to finally listening to the audiobook Deceived after Revan, because I just started Revan. And um, I'm about an hour in, and so far it picks up where you're catching up with Revan as he's on Coruscant, kind of figuring out what to do with his life now that he's, uh, you know, 
campaign through the Mandalorian Wars and nearly wiped out the Jedi Order before the Jedi wiped his memory and reeled him back in, and they defeated Malak and saved the galaxy. Pretty big freaking deal. So he's just kind of chilling on Coruscant with Bastilla. Um, they're not really doing a lot, and now, um, obviously, the story picks up, and then he encounters the Emperor and all of that stuff happens, and it gets pretty pretty heavy. But it's just so great, because a big reason why I think people shouldn't sleep on Star Wars audiobooks, or just really Star Wars books in general, and especially Legends books, because you really don't get as much of this detail in new canon books, if we're being totally honest. It's just not there. Yeah, It's just not. The details of, like, Plagueis standing under his shuttle on Naboo as he's about to go assassinate someone. And the book takes a moment to just acknowledge him looking down at his boots and the puddle that he's standing in. Or Darth Scourge on Drummond Kass discussing the lightning storms on the planet and what might have caused them through Vitiate's um, Sith alchemy and, and, and just the detail that goes into the psychology of a Sith pure blood fresh out of the academy because that is something that I think is so cool to the older public. There were academies for the Sith. Yeah, or curricula. I mean, there's just so much detail and so so much so much to be immersed in that you don't get in new canon Star Wars books, that you don't get in the films, that you don't get in the shows. All right, how many make everything feel so real? Interjection. Yeah. I'm going to just mm. keep yelling. Mm -hmm. With quality and storytelling, all right, you have to conform to your medium. Movies can't go into, into deep psychological analysis unless that's the goal of the movie. Sure. In a Star Wars story where you want these, where, where the goal and the objective of the movie is to entertain the audience with big space battles, it's really hard to, to slow down. And to get a, a, a perspective moment. Just 100%. because of the fact that you have very limited time. With a book, you don't have limited time at all. You, have all you time can the spend world. chapters and chapters describing the thoughts in Plagueis' head during a 15-minute situation. That's, I mean, that was a big thing, too. I was, I, was, I was expecting the ultimate murder of Plagueis to be something that happens fast. And I mean, no spoilers for how it actually goes down or what, what is said in that moment. But... It's actually like a ten minute scene, man. It's it's yeah. actually fairly long. But, but um, anyway, so that's why we don't get it in the movies. We don't get it in New Canon because of the fact that children have short attention spans, and everything in New Canon has to be family friendly, right? A kid does not care about the deep psychological, the deep psychological detriment that is Plagueis, right? They don't care about his struggle and his frustration and and. Sure. And his um, and his ego. They don't care about that. They don't care about the way his his boots reflect off of a puddle as he you know looks back to the Sith of old. They don't care. They need focused, concise stories that make simple sense. All right, A B to C to D. Not A. Stay around A for a little while. Go A to E inside of his head, and then go to B. That doesn't make sense to a little kid. And, right. and, and and this is what I was saying earlier, where where structurally the legends books are more sound, they're they're better, they're more artistically fulfilling and and more they're they're just better they're just better books fundamentally because of the fact that they are written in respect to the audience. They are written for adults and people who who seek out good literature. As opposed to children, who just need to be entertained. Not even just that, man. I mean, they're just written for Star Wars. And of course, written for hardcore Star Wars fans. Of course, that's true. But just, I mean, written for the series, if that makes sense. Yeah. It doesn't matter what kind of a Star Wars fan you are. It is a book that is in the Star Wars universe, and that, that goes for Plagueis, that goes for Revan, that goes for uh, you know a myriad of other of other Star Wars novels. It's almost like it, it's it's a near objective thing that I'm trying to say here, where it's like it is in the Star Wars galaxy, it is in the Star Wars universe. You are following these characters around, and it feels very real. Take it or leave it, right? 
Um, and it's just really refreshing. So if you're like me and you are doing something that grants you the time to be able to listen to audiobooks in the Star Wars universe, whether it be Legends or Canon, um, if you if you if you paint or, or do any other task um, that doesn't require you know direct focus all the time, I mean audiobooks are just dude, and it's, again, especially Legends, and I'm excited. Because I, I talk about this with, with uh, Corey from First Order Transmissions a lot, and of course Tate and I, we talk about it all the time, too, on the show. Um, and it's kind of more of a recent thing, so I don't want to say we talk about it all the time on the show, but definitely um, when we're not recording, doing the show. Um, because of the mess that was the sequel trilogy, despite all the good that it may have done here and there, which is menial compared to the complete mess they created. And I, I mean, we, we won't, I don't want to rag on it, the sequel trilogy, but star Wars has just gone so downhill and, and Disney has, has, they have sent all of the wrong messages. I think to star Wars fans basically say, stating they are accepting of mediocrity. They are willing to forfeit the stories that came before, that their new stories are directly connected to. They don't care about the stories that came before. All they care about, of course, is the bottom line. How can they package Star Wars to please Disney standards while still making one to two billion dollars a shot? How can we ignore the parts of Star Wars that we don't like and then just tell Star Wars fans to deal with it? I I feel like, as a Star Wars fan, someone who loves the saga, not just the prequels, but the original trilogy too, I'm tired of having my passion and my, my love for this series toyed with. I don't appreciate it anymore. I, I don't appreciate it going in looking for a story that I thought would be respectful and, 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 and deserving uh, to follow in the footsteps of the incredible saga that came before, to then just go on Twitter or read an interview where those working on Star Wars claim to be fans. They, they claim to have that same passion. They claim all of these things. But then... They just tell you your version of Star Wars doesn't align with Disney's futures, you know, their, their, their future ideas for the series. That if, if you liked the prequels, get out of here. If you wanted to see the original trilogy cast assemble one last time, get out of here. If you wanted a coherent, basically, a basic functioning narrative for the main character of the trilogy, get out of here. I, you know, if if you if you thought this part of Legends was was really interesting and still fits in well with the ongoing current continuity that is Star Wars canon, but no, that's actually Legends, and here's a much less less interesting version of that. That is what we are deeming canon. That's it, and what you actually liked, even though almost objectively more interesting, is now Legends. It, it, it it's just like. Everywhere I look with Disney Star Wars, you're just being slapped on the wrist. Everywhere. And The Mandalorian, of course, is the one exception that a lot of people bring up, and I do appreciate that The Clone Wars is getting its final 12 episodes. I'll always be grateful for that. But The Mandalorian is a very simple story about side characters in the Star Wars galaxy, right? Well, maybe not. I mean, they're getting, I mean, the story kind of the stakes increase um, toward the end of season one. But the point is, it's not a rich and in-depth detailed story. It's not the space opera that I fell in love with as a kid. Um, it is just this more one-dimensional who's going to be the next Jedi, who's going to who's gonna restore hope, who's going to hop in the X-Wing next, who's going to kill the bad guy, who's going to turn to the dark side, just bullshit back and forth as they just rehash other elements 
that have come before, literally making the galaxy look exactly the same as it did 35 years prior. And I, I'm just... So basically, to conclude my whole long extended rant here, I am, am at the point now where once we get through the final episodes of The Clone Wars and I exhaust all the best Legends material that does offer rich and in-depth, detailed, multi-layered stories that take place in the Star Wars universe, I'm about at the point that Tate has been at already for quite some time, (laughs) where I'm just ready to unwind, man. You know, over this next year, as I listen to all these audiobooks, as as I get through... um the parts of Star Wars that I find genuinely interesting that I slept on all this time that I never got into. I'm at the point, man, where once I exhaust all of that, I'm done. I'll, I'll watch the Mandalorian season two, of course, you know, we'll, we'll cover it here. I'll, I'll, I'll be there for Obi-Wan, but I know the Obi-Wan series is not going to be everything that we're looking for. I've, Aside from John Favreau, Dave Filoni, and Deborah Chow, I see no other Star Wars fans working on the franchise. I see original trilogy fans and people who may have grew up with the films and now might have rewatched them before working on whatever it is they're doing for Disney now. And I'm, I'm talking to people like, say, you know, Taika Waititi maybe or Bryce Dallas Howard. I, I, I don't want to assume, but I'm just saying, I'm not seeing the same passion that you saw in not just George Lucas himself, but even the passion of John Knoll or Doug Chang or those at ILM or or those who did work with George on the original films, whether it be the prequels or the... It's not coming through anymore, man. And I don't want to continue to be here while Star Wars hollows itself out but still makes it past the billion dollar mark. It's like, sure, I don't think Star Wars is dying. I think Star Wars is, is you know, still going to function here and now and into the future. But it's not necessarily a future that I want to see. For it's going to function as well as... I, I, don't, I, I can't equate it to anything. I mean, it, it's going to function like a, like a dog without legs. You know what I mean? It can still eat. It can still piss. You still sleep, but what's it really yeah, doing? It's like, yeah, it's like it's like a it's like a you know the the stories of, of people who um who their their pet passes away and and then they get a they get one bread that's just like it and try to pretend like it was the original one. You know what I mean? Yeah. And. Uh, I know it's a really weird and extreme analogy, but it kind of gets the point across where it's just like, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just exhausted at this point, man. And what scares me, of course, about it is, this is the future of Star Wars. We are in the minority, and that's a shame. So it's kind of like, you know, you've been on this cruise ship all your life, and. It's just like everyone on the cruise ship still thinks that we're totally fine, even though we're on the fucking, we're in the fucking Bermuda Triangle. But now there's a dock, and I'm just packing my bags, the things I love, and then just hopping off, wishing them good luck as it sails away. <laughs> you know, it's like I know that's a really weird analogy, but I mean, just to convey the the, the points, it's just like it's not. Star Wars anymore. And and even those who really try to prop up the best parts of Disney Star Wars, I mean, we certainly do, wherever we can. There are incredible things that have come from it. Um, various scenes trickled throughout that really, I think, will be iconic and memorable, and, and there are good things. There are plenty of good things that have come with Disney Star Wars, but... It's not the same anymore. And I always thought going into Disney Star Wars, I mean, you know, I very much walked in the same mindset that I think a lot of people did. It's Star Wars. 
no matter what, it's Star Wars, and I will always be there to support it. And I, and, and, and in many ways, I still will be, but not to the same capacity. Not where I walk in. Not where I'm there for every trailer and every new announcement. It's just... It's just exhaustion, man. So, I don't know. I felt like that was a... a, a it was a good thing to just kind of rehash and, and bring up again, because it is different, right? Where now that we're past the Mandalorian, and, and we've seen just after... You know, Bless you. Sorry. After watching Chapter 5 of The Mandalorian, the absolute mediocre trash that was th that episode, and, and, and people, you know, making a case for The Rise of Skywalker actually being a decent film. And I believe it is a fun film. That does not mean it's a good film. Um, it's a fun turn-off-your-brain film and just don't think about it, but if this is how, pe if this is how the majority of people want Star Wars to be going forward and, and Disney does not see the need to change anything because rise just managed to, you know, of course get past the billion dollar mark by all means stay the course, but I'm done. I'm jumping off the ship. I already <laughs> jumped off the ship, dude. I've been in the water just watching it as it slowly <laughs> sinks as the hole fills with water. No, no, no. This is this has been Star Wars. This has been Star Wars for me, right? I jumped off the ship in about 2015, right? Just because I, I was really sick of, uh, I, you know, I really liked. Um, no, 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 no. Not 2015, because Rogue One came out what 2016. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So like after Rogue One, I was like super on board with it, and then you know Last Jedi just didn't excite me. Kind of jumped off the ship. And now I've just watch, I'm just watching the ship slowly Dude. sink, and I see Ross's head peeking out of the of the quarters. His his room on the cruise ship is right <laughs> at water level. Ross's head is barely above water, and he's just he's just there looking at me as I laugh at him in the water <laughs> on my floaty chair, on my floaty with chair your, that is legend. With legends. your to call in George Lucas, but it'll never actually come to save you. Ross, I have a floaty chair that's built out of Legends novels. As I'm just watching the ship. You're not trying to paint. <laughs> uh, I just pictured that. Oh man. Oh man. Um, so verdict. Legends is good. Listen to le read or listen to Legends novels. You will not be disappointed. Yep, I agree. I agree 100. percent but before we end the show here, let's talk about something serious. We need to talk about politics. As if our Star Wars talk was not serious enough, now we are journeying to the Middle East. It's it's a real shame, man. I mean, I, I've been I've been watching these these videos of the of the Iranian protests. These people are just completely distraught. The non patriots are the ones that I feel most sorry for. You know, because there there are people calling for a war against the U.S. and and people like that. No, but there are, there are people that are genuinely scared. There are people that are rational, saying, hey, the U.S. has a military 30 times more mighty than ours, right? The U.S. W could decimate us in a ground war. They could decimate us in a nuclear war. The U.S. could decimate anyone in any kind of warfare. The Iranian people are scared, and it's horrible to see. It, 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 I don't want to... I don't want to I don't want to broadcast my political views because that's something I keep private. Ross, you know how I feel about about the situation. But yeah. I wish we would look at at humanity for humanity's sake. Say, hey, maybe this is something we need to restructure, something we need to look at and really analyze. Or if we open our borders to Iranian immigration and, and take in refugees, because pretty soon there's going to be a lot of them. This this conflict, it's not an armistice. It, it is it is heating up. It is heating up and it is heating up fast. The U.S., you know, they had that first blow. They had that second blow. Iran had enough. They they hit us with the with the one two. But their damage is nominal compared to the damage we've caused to them, and it's just scary that two extreme patriots. 
because I, I, Iran is a very patriotic country. Two extreme patriots are, are now locked in, a, in an altercation. Will this spark another world war? No. No, no, no. This is, this, is a, this is a conflict between the U.S. and a couple countries. But, I mean, if, if what I think will happen and, and Iran and Iraq start, start invading uh, allied countries, U.S. allied countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, civilians are going to die. And then more people are going to get involved and it's just going to wind up the same as every other conflict does. No winners, only losers. Yeah. As Americans, Ross and I are safe. We're far, far away. That's what's always crazy is that all of that is still happening on this planet. You know, it never yeah. the, the horrors of of, of the, the, just the horrors in the world, and just knowing that it's just one flight away. It's like, oh yeah, not a very long flight even. I mean, it's like it's twelve hours to freaky. fly there. It's freaky. Yeah, it, it is. It's my whole life. It's never. It's never been. It's never, it's never not been strange. Yeah. How horrible things truly are across the ocean. I mean, just across, you know, a body of water. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, if yeah. you are a Middle Eastern viewer, stay safe, man. Get out of there. <laughs> Get out. I'd be very surprised if we had any watching the show. But... If, if we do... Get out. I really, I really do hope that that the people don't suffer, because that's the scary thing. They will, they will. If this, if this does not die down, people will suffer. Mm. Anyway, that was a sad note to end on. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh man. Well. um in a slightly more positive no oh, oh. sorry, I was looking at this on my phone. Um, in a slightly more positive on a slightly more positive note. Uh, you guys might have noticed, uh, anyone's still watching. Uh, <laughs> there's been more activity on my channel as I've been posting um, a bit more content. I've been posting some skits up of something I have tried out over the last uh, couple weeks and it's um, it's gone pretty well. And so I've been really happy to see that as I've uh, diversified um, content just a little bit more as I work on this next showcase. I'm actively working on Hawkeye and uh, Black Widow for the next showcase, and and it's these figures are, are have turned out to be a bit more detailed um, than I originally thought they would be, which is part of the reason why they have uh, taken so long. But then also because of just the uh, the variety of, of different crises um, that found me in the uh, last portion of 2019. Uh, Really throughout 2019, but ultimately fully culminated at the end of the year. And um, despite my my ass being like, "All right, three more months in 2019, let's finish." And nope, <laughs> life was like, "Hey, can we commit to a project? Fuck out of here." I was like, "Okay." Um, Why yeah. just hello, motherfucker? So anyway, um, working on Black Widow, working on Ronan. Gearing up for the next showcase should be great. Look out on uh, the Instagram page and all those places for the teasers. Progress goes up on Patreon as always. And um, guys, Ronan looks really good. Let me tell you that. I'm, I'm going to say this right now. This is a spoiler. It's it's really easy for for ninja spy characters to all look the same because black jumpsuits are black jumpsuits. But Ronan looks really cool. Yeah, he's got a very interesting costume, and I've been. Doing my best to um, make it as accurate as I could, as accurate as I think is necessary. And um, that has involved adding more detail, like I said, than I originally signed up for it. But um, it will ultimately serve the figure as uh, this could be my last Hawkeye figure ever if uh, Hawkeye the series doesn't go through. Um, and I just I don't know whenever I'm going to go back to making the 2012 Avengers team as much as I would really like to. Um, but the point is, it's going to be great. Showcase is going to be great. Much like the first time game showcase, there will be some really cool edits um, for the or for, for, for uh, Hawkeye and Widow to kind of recap their time in the MCU. Looking forward to doing those. And um, it should be a good time. 
I guess. Well, until sometime later this week, probably Wednesday, this has been The Outer Regions. Thank you guys so much for watching. And remember, this is the way. Bye, guys. Okay.